My name is Chris Wright, and our topic today is what I've called Saints in the Public Square. Let me just share my screen so we can see that. Uh, there are various terms actually for what we're talking about in this lecture. Uh, the marketplace, the workplace, the secular world, the public arena, and so on. I'm just calling it for the moment the public square, by which I mean the whole world of human work, trade, professions, law, government, education, industry, the arts, the sciences, etc. Wherever human beings uh, engage together to get things done. The Old Testament word for this actually was the gate. That is quite literally the public square just inside the walls of the town or the village where people met and did their business together of whatever kind that was. This is the world of human social engagement and economic activity. It's actually where most people, including most Christians, spent most of our time one way or another. So let's uh, think first of all for a little while about God and the public square. Uh, and the question really is, is God interested in that? Many Christians seem to operate on the everyday assumption that God is not really interested in the public world or the so-called secular world, or at least they presume that God is interested in the workplace only as a place for potential evangelism. God, it would seem on this opinion, God cares about the church and about its affairs and about getting people to heaven, but not about how society and its public places are conducted here on earth. And the result of that can be a very dichotomized way of thinking and living as Christians. Because obviously many of us, most of you probably, have to invest most of the time that matters, that is our working lives, in a place and a task that we think doesn't really matter much to God, while we're struggling to find opportunities to give some leftover time, whatever we can, to the only thing that we think does matter to God such as evangelism or prayer or working in the church. And so we have this great divide between my work, which is most of our time, and God's work, which is hopefully a bit of our time, which is very unsatisfying, very frustrating, and actually very unbiblical. Because the Bible, it seems to me, both clearly and comprehensively in both Testaments, portrays God as intensely interested in human public life and work, interested, yes, and involved and in charge and indeed thoroughly intentional. So let's think then uh, about this. Here we go. God and the public square. First of all, God created it. You see, work is God's idea. Genesis 1 and 2 give us our first picture of the God of the Bible. And it presents God to us, God presents himself to us as a worker. There he is, thinking, choosing, planning, executing, and evaluating something that he does and accomplishes. God works. So when God decides to create humankind in the image and likeness of God, what else could humans be but workers, reflecting in their working lives something of the nature of God himself? And specifically, God laid upon human beings the task of ruling the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and of serving and keeping it in Genesis chapter 2. So this enormous task required, first of all, the, the complementarity of being created male and female for mutual help, because a man is no good at this task alone. No, it's, it's a task that is built in with some other fundamental economic and ecological dimensions of human life. God has given us a planet with a vast diversity of resources that are scattered all over the surface of the earth. So there is at a very basic level an obvious need for trade and exchange between groups of people living in different places so as to meet one another's needs. And that task in turn necessitates economic relationships and so there's a need for fairness and justice through the whole social and economic realm on this planet Earth. There needs to be justice, both in the sharing of raw resources with which we work, and also in the distribution and the products of our work. So the biblical witness is then that 
all of this human endeavor, all of this human work is part of God's intention for human life on earth. Work matters because God made us workers like God himself created in his image. So then uh, to come back to our screen, Perhaps the first thing that we have to ask those who are Christians who are working in the marketplace, in, in the public arena, is do you see your work as nothing more than a necessary evil, something that you've got to get through, or perhaps at best a context for evangelistic opportunities? Or do you see it as a means of glorifying God through participating in God's purposes for creation? And therefore, that your work has some intrinsic value to you and to God. How do you relate what you do in your daily work to the Bible's teaching about human responsibility in creation and society? Those are good questions to ask at the very, at the very upfront. But then we move on to a second thing here that the Bible teaches us about God and the public square and the world of work. And that is that God audits it. Now, I think we're probably all fairly familiar with the function of an auditor. The auditor provides independent, impartial, and objective scrutiny of a company or a charity's activities and claims. The auditor has access to all the documents, all the evidence. Uh, to him, all books are open, all decisions known, and from him, no secrets are hidden. Auditors inspect they inquire, they examine, they disclose. Well, that at least is the theory. Now, according to the Bible, God is the auditor. He is the independent judge of all that goes on in the public square, in the arena of human social life. The Old Testament speaks repeatedly of Yahweh, the God of Israel, as the God who sees and knows and evaluates. And this is true uh, in a most universal sense of every individual. Here again, as we move back to our screen, you take a, a place like Psalm 33, where we read that from heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on the earth. He forms the hearts of all and he considers everything they do. That's an auditing function. But it's specifically the public square that Israel was repeatedly reminded that that's where God calls for justice, justice in the gate, as the prophets would say, that is in the public square, the marketplace, the court, for example, in Amos chapter five, where God says, I know how many are your offenses and how great are your sins. You oppress the righteous and you take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. But says God, you need to hate evil and love good and maintain justice in the courts. And furthermore, God hears the kind of talk that goes on in the underhand, secret, greedy world of some kinds of business practices and trading. Here's Amos chapter 8, where God says, Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? And well, will the Sabbath be ended that we can market our wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat? But the Lord says, I will never forget what they have done. God is the auditor. He sees, he hears, he knows. And for those who think that God is confined to the temple, and the temple courts uh, in the Old Testament, or the church, as we might say today, and sees only what is going on there in religious observance, Jeremiah brings something of a shock, uh, that God is also watching what goes on in the rest of the week in the public sphere. And so Jeremiah asks in chapter 7, will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury and burn incense to Baal and follow other gods that you've not known? And then come before me and stand in this house which bears my name and say, we are saved. What? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But, says God, I have been watching, declares the Lord. So yes, God is the auditor. 
the independent inspector of all that happens in the public arena. And what he therefore demands, as auditors should, is complete transparency, integrity. This was the standard that was expected of human judges in their exercise of public office. And one, one interesting example of this is the case of Samuel. Uh, at the end of his life, when he was handing over, as it were, the, the authority and saying he'd grown too old, he defends his public record and he calls both the people and God to witness, as it were, as his divine auditor. Here I'm reading from 1 Samuel chapter 12, where Samuel said to all Israel, I've listened to everything that you've said to me. I've set this king over you. That's, of course, King Saul. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I'm old and gray and my sons are here with you. And he says, I've been your leader from my youth until this day. So here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I stolen? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these things, I will make it right, says Samuel. And the people reply, you have not cheated or oppressed us. You have not taken anything from the Lord's hand. And Samuel said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. Samuel stands there as a model of accountability, transparency and integrity because he knew that God was his judge. So I think the, the next question we have to ask of those who are at work in the world then is how and when do you consciously submit to God's audit of your daily work? In what way does your accountability to God, not just to your boss, affect the way you do your work? Do you see yourself as working for God and before God in his presence, day by day, at the desk, in the place of work, wherever it is that God is the auditor? So the world of work, God created it, God audits it. Now here's a, a third perspective that the Bible brings uh, to the public's, uh, public awareness, the public arena. And that is that God governs it and judges it. Now, we know, of course, that human public life, the marketplace, or just the market, as it's sometimes called, is made up of human choices for which human beings are accountable and responsible. The markets behave, as we're told in economic theory, as the outcome of millions upon millions of individual human choices. So in that sense, all that happens in the public arena, in the marketplace, is a matter of human action and choice and moral responsibility. And yet, at the same time, the Bible puts it all under God's sovereign government. See, the Bible affirms both sides of this, paragraph, of this paradox. On the one hand, human beings are morally responsible for our choices and our actions and the public consequences that they have. And yet, on the other hand, God retains sovereign control over the final outcomes and destinies of human public life in the economic and in the political sphere. And there are many Bible stories that, that illustrate this. Uh, here, here, here are some. Let me go back uh, to our slides here. There's the story of Joseph. Familiar story there in Genesis, which moves from family life and then into the public arena in Egypt at the highest level of state power in relation to political and agricultural and economic and even foreign affairs. And in those narratives, all the human actors are personally morally responsible for their own motives and words and actions, whether good or evil. But the words of Joseph to his brothers at the very end of the story and at the end of the book of Genesis express God's view of all that had been happening through that long story. We read there in Genesis 50 that Joseph said to them, don't be afraid, am I in place of God? And then he says, you, you my brothers, you intended to harm me. 
Literally, it is, you meant it for evil, he says. He's not making any excuses for them. They chose to do what they did to sell him into slavery and everything else. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That's God's sovereignty over human actions. And the same perspective, of course, shapes the stories of Daniel and Esther. And in all three cases, Joseph, Daniel, and Esther, the public arena is pagan, as we might say. That is, these events take place in nations that are quite outside the covenant community of Israel. The human political authorities, in all three cases, Egypt, Babylon, Persia, they bear no allegiance to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And yet, in all three cases, it is the will of Yahweh, the God of Israel, that governs the outcomes of all their political and economic decisions. So it's, it's significant then that when the prophets turn their attention to the great empires of their day, they affirm God's government just as much over those other nations and empires as over his own covenant people Israel. And that includes their public works, the marketplace, just as much as, as the military and all their adventures in conquering others. So, for example, um, Isaiah chapter 19 puts the whole of Egypt under God's judgment, including its religion, its uh, irrigation project, its agriculture, its fisheries, its textile industry, its politicians, its universities. It's all, as it were, under the governing judgment of God. Or you look at Ezekiel chapter 26 and 28, that's a sustained lament for the great seaport city of Tyre, when God's judgment would fall on them for their domination of the maritime trade routes that stretched right across the Mediterranean. So they're portrayed as a great trading ship filled with the cargoes of the nations, which God sinks in the depths of the sea to great fear and trembling. Or we think again uh, of Daniel uh, and Daniel chapter 4, which portrays the arrogance of King Nebuchadnezzar, who's gloating over his city. And he says, is not this great Babylon, which I have built as my royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? But the verdict of God was that his whole building project was on the backs of the poor and the oppressed. As Daniel points out to him, when he says in verse 27, therefore my king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. And then it may be that your prosperity will continue. Well, Nebuchadnezzar refused to take that advice. And instead of humbling himself, he found himself humiliated into a more sober frame of mind. And in that Daniel chapter 4, the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had to learn uh, was that God governs the public square along with everything else. Or in Daniel's more graphic words that, he, that are there in the, in the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar, heaven rules and the most high God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. And so that's why you see, at the end of the great Bible narrative in the book of Revelation, uh, in Revelation chapter 18, Babylon becomes the code name for the whole global economic political system. And, and it portrays God as the ultimate judge on its greed and injustice and cruel oppression that causes so much human suffering. And so that means therefore that I think the third question that we have to ask of those who are seeking to follow Jesus in the so-called secular workplace and marketplace out there in the public square is, where and how do you perceive the governance of God in the marketplace, seeing God as the one who's in charge? What does it mean in that sense to do as Jesus said and to seek first the kingdom of God, the sovereignty of God, the rule of God, and his justice. And what difference does it make when you do? Is it simply the case that heaven rules, to quote Daniel, on Sundays, but the market rules from Monday to Friday? And Saturday's a kind of day off for everybody. 
or are we thinking through this issue more carefully in terms of how we relate the sovereign governance of God to the world of public affairs in the political and international arena? And so we turn then to our fourth perspective uh, on the whole biblical world of work. And it's a glorious surprise, and that is that God redeems it. And that, I hope, may come as something of a surprise. Because a pretty common Christian assumption that many people make is that everything that happens here on earth is nothing more than temporary and transient and really has nothing to do with God or eternity. Life here is, is just a kind of vestibule, a kind of entrance lobby for eternity. So it doesn't really matter very much. It, it, it just, we don't need to bother about it too much. That's what many Christians think. And that very negative view of life on the earth, I think is, is partly drawn from a mistaken interpretation of the language of 2 Peter chapter 3, where we, it talks about the apparent obliteration, the destruction of the whole earth, and indeed of all the physical creations, creation. And if that's where it's all headed, you know, it's all just going to be burnt up, uh, then what eternal value can there possibly be to the work that we do in the here and now in this world? But the point I would want to make here is this, coming back to our, our screen, that that passage there in 2 Peter 3 is really talking about the destruction of the evil world of human sin, the, the cleansing of the earth from the ungodly. Just as in the first half of the chapter, Peter talks about the, the destruction of the wicked in the flood, Noah's flood, when the world, world was destroyed, he uses that word, by water. And in the same way, he says it will be destroyed by fire. He's using the symbolism of fire uh, as a cleansing metaphor, purging, not the total obliteration, but the cleansing and purging of the earth. So you see, this is the, this is the very different perspective that the Bible presents on this, that God plans ultimately to redeem all that he has made. Because as Psalm 145 tells us, God loves all that he has made. And included within all that God has made is all that we have made with what God has made, or what God has given to us, as, as it were. Our use of creation, our enhancement and development of creation in the great cultural mandate of our civilizations. Now, of course, of course, we know that all that we human beings have done on this earth has been tainted, twisted, spoiled by our sinful, fallen human nature. We are sinners. And just as we need to be cleansed and purified by God, so also do all our works. But you see, that's exactly the picture that we have in both the Old and the New Testament. It's a vision of redemption, not obliteration, of cleansing and restoration of all that is good and valuable in God's creation and in what we have done with it. There's a wonderful passage in Isaiah 65 which expresses this, that's particularly verses 17 to 25, where we have this glorious portrayal of what God says, I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth, a whole new creation, says God. And it looks forward to human life in this new creation that will be long, no longer will be subject to weariness and decay and death, in which there will be the fulfillment of family life and working life, in which all the curses of frustration and injustice and unfairness will be gone forever, in which there will be close, joyful fellowship with God, and also, indeed, in which there will be environmental harmony and safety within the animal and vegetable creation. The whole of human life, private life, family life, public life, will be redeemed and restored by God to glorifying productiveness. That's Isaiah's vision there in Isaiah 65. And this is not just Old Testament stuff because the New Testament carries this vision forward in the light of the redemption achieved by Christ through his cross. And especially, of course, in the light of his resurrection, which we are told is the first fruits of the new creation. Paul is speaking about 
the whole creation when in Colossians chapter one, he talks five times about all things in heaven and on earth. And he says that this totality, this creational totality of, of the heavens and the earth has not only been created by Christ and for Christ and is being sustained by Christ, but it's also redeemed by Christ through the blood of his cross. That's there, that incredible passage, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And because of this plan of redemption that God has for the whole of creation and for ourselves, it means that we look forward to the redemption of ourselves and creation together. As Paul puts it in Romans 8, that the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. But the creation was subjected to frustration, yes, of course, because of our sin and evil, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope, that is, in the certainty that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And that's why, therefore, the final vision of the Bible there in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 is not of us escaping from the earth to go to some other place up in heaven, but rather of God coming down to live with us again in a cleansed and restored creation from which all evil will have been purged. And John describes that new creation as the city of God, doesn't he? And, and he sees all the glory of human civilization cleansed and purified of all evil being brought into the city of God. Here's what he says in Revelation 21, verses 24 to 27. The nations will walk by its light, that is, the light of Christ himself in the city of God. And the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there'll be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, those words, splendor, glory, honor of kings and nations, uh, must mean that the combined product of generations of human beings whose lives and effort and work have generated this vast store of human culture and civilization. In other words, what will be brought into the city of God in the new creation, I think what these verses are telling us, will be this vast accumulated output of human work through the ages, all, of course, purged of evil, restored, redeemed, and then laid at the feet of Christ in order to enhance the life of eternity in God's new creation. That's where it is all headed. That's what God's plan for it is, redemption. Not simply taking all that humanity has ever done through all the generations of human life and just kind of tossing it into a cosmic incinerator. No, God's plan ultimately is its redemption, purging and restoration. And I wonder, doesn't that, doesn't that transform uh, our whole attitude and perspective to Monday mornings when we go to the world of our work? So, what this is saying is that all human history that, that takes place within the marketplace of public human interaction will be redeemed and purged and in some sense fulfilled in the new creation, not just abandoned and destroyed, which means that all our human work has value. It has significance, not just because of our role within creation from the beginning, when God told us to do this stuff, to be rulers and servants of creation, but also because of the new creation and the eschatological hope that it sets before us. And so with, with such a hope, then we can heartily follow Paul's exhortation. Do you remember it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he's talked all about the resurrection of Jesus and how important that is, and where he says, therefore, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord, that is in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, is not in vain. Knowing that the work we do for the Lord isn't just religious work, so to speak, but any work that is done as unto the Lord, which includes 
even the manual labor of slaves, as Paul would tell them in Colossians and Ephesians. So coming back to our questions then, it seems to me that uh, what we've seen here is that, uh, that if this is the future prospect for the marketplace, then we need to be asking ourselves in what ways is my daily labor, what I have to do for most of my time, in what sense is it transformed by the knowledge that in some way it is contributing to what God will one day redeem and include within the new creation. Now, I don't know how that will be. I don't know that it means that every report I have to write or every brick I have to lay or every piece of work that I do, somehow that's gonna be there in heaven as it were. But that there is something about this which is saying that just as God has the power to restore my resurrection body to be what he wants it to be in the new creation, it doesn't mean that this thumb is just going to be there in heaven. It means that I, as I am in my person, as this embodied human being, God will redeem and restore and resurrect to new life in the new creation. So it will be also for our work. So then, what have we seen? We've seen God's view, God's view of the public square, the social world of work, of economics, of politics, of government. And according to the Bible, God created it, he audits it, he governs and judges it, and he will ultimately redeem it. So that leads us on then uh, to thinking now about, well, then what ought to be the attitude and the role and the mission of God's people in that sphere? What about Christians, us believers in the public sphere? And once again, the Bible has got plenty to say on that. So here we go to that. Christians in the public square. And here I've got two things that I want to say that first of all, we are called to engagement, but at the same time, we are called to distinctiveness. Those two things, engagement and distinctiveness. Let's think of each of them in turn. First of all, we are called to engagement. And how can we be doing that? Well, first of all, it can very simply be done by actually serving the state, by actually engaging in public or political or civic office. The Old Testament, as we've seen, contains quite notable examples of believers, that is, believers in the God of Israel, uh, who were engaged in the public arena, in the service, as we saw, of pagan empires and powers, like Joseph and Daniel. But, you know, the New Testament also urges Christians to be good citizens, good workers, paying our taxes uh, and so on, and therefore to be good witnesses to our creator and redeemer God. Work is still a creational good. That's to say it is a good thing to work and it's good to do good by working. In fact, Paul quite frequently instructs Christians to be doers of good. It's, it's all one word uh, in Greek, good doers. Uh, not, uh, not goody goodies, but, but doers of good. And when Paul uses that kind of language, it doesn't just mean being nice. Those terms that Paul uses, there were, there were two or three of them, they all had a common social meaning in his day, which people understood. Doers of good referred to people in society who did notable acts of public service or benefaction, benefactors they were known as for wider society, whether they might be Roman citizens who perhaps built some swimming pool or some baths or some temple or some theater, and then their name would go on there as a benefactor, a good doer, someone who had benefited society. And what Paul is saying here is that Christians should be among those whose work is out there in the world for the common good and thereby to commend the gospel, which is good news. And one example of this actually in the New Testament is Erastus, who you may or may not have heard of uh, because he only gets referred to twice. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 22, he's one of Paul's companions. So for part of his time, he was traveling with Paul. But then at the end of Romans, we read that Erastus had become the director of public works for the city of Corinth, which was actually a very 
responsible and pretty senior civic role major responsibilities to make sure that the food supply was there, the water supply was there to keep peace and law and order and so on. And there's Erastus, a Christian believer, serving Corinth, a Roman city of that time. So we can serve in the public arena. A second way, of course, that we can engage publicly is by praying for and seeking the welfare of the city. Now, those words as you probably know, come from Jeremiah's letter to the exiles in Babylon, in Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, where in verse 7 he says, Also seek the welfare of the city where I have put you, and pray to the Lord for it. Now that's, <laughs> that's a pretty astonishing instruction, because remember, those people of Judah were exiles in the land of an enemy who had destroyed their city and their temple, and had, dragged them a thousand miles away from home. They, they were prisoners of war. They were captives in Babylon. And yet Jeremiah says, yeah, well, seek the welfare of that city. Pray for that city. God tells them, you see, to, to remember their calling as the children of Abraham. They were to be a blessing to all nations, even their enemies, in the way they lived and prayed and worked and simply cared for the welfare of the people who were around them. And what a challenge that is for us as Christians, if that was what the exiles of Judah were supposed to be doing. And I wonder perhaps whether Paul had that letter of Jeremiah in mind when he told Timothy to make sure that his churches were regularly praying for the state authorities, meaning, of course, in his day, the Roman authorities and government. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Many churches that I've been in never seem to pray for the secular authorities, for the, the government, for judges, for uh, their president and so on. It's important that we engage in the public arena, not just through service and action and work, but also through prayer. And then thirdly, of course, another way in which we engage in the public square is one that's open to anybody. In fact, probably most of you, is that we can do it by ordinary, honest, everyday work. It seems that uh, in some of the churches that Paul knew, particularly the one that he very early had founded in Thessalonica, that some people were thinking, you see, that ordinary work was no longer really any value. And they became lazy. And, and then they spiritualized their idleness with saying, well, you know, Jesus is coming back soon, so we can just give up our jobs. You don't need to work anymore. Well, Paul agreed with them, of course, about Christ's return but he didn't approve of that kind of attitude, that they were just opting out of normal human responsibilities and work and becoming idle and lazy. No, he says, and here's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, no, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands, just as we did, and as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and that you will not be dependent on anybody. And of course, Paul could appeal to his own example as one who had supported himself uh, through his own labor. He worked for his living in the secular workplace as a tent maker. As he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And we did this, he adds, in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. So you see, Paul insists then that in serving others in society by working, we are also serving God. In fact, even to Christian slaves who would be working for non-Christian pagan masters who might be very cruel, Paul can say to them, you know, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So I think we need to recover a really much more biblical understanding of service and work. 
or what we think of sometimes when we use this word ministry. Because, you know, sadly, we still suffer from this dichotomized split worldview in which the word ministry is confined to full-time paid work within the church or paid by the church, such as a pastor or an evangelist or a theological teacher or a missionary or whatever else it might be. And everything else that isn't, as it were, church-based isn't ministry. No, it's just work. But ministry, serving, service, servanthood, is what we are all called to in all of life as servants of God and as disciples of Christ. I mean, there are all kinds of ministries that are available to us, including in the so-called, falsely so-called, secular callings. The public sphere out there in the world can be just as much a place of ministry as the church. In Romans 13, for example, it's interesting that Paul speaks about the Roman governing authorities as servants of God. And he uses the exact same words that are also used for ministers in the church, diakonoi theu. Political service, judicial service, can also be the service of God. Ministry, in other words. And then uh, in Acts chapter 6, uh, the same word, diakonia, ministry or service, is used both of the ministry of the word, to which the apostles were called, and the ministry of tables, for which the seven were appointed. One was a teaching ministry, serving the scriptures. The other was a social ministry, serving food. But both were ministries. One was a priority for the apostles. The other was a priority for those who were selected and appointed to do it. It was their calling. Now, the text does not say that one form of ministry was more important than the other, only that the apostles knew what was the priority for them as apostles, not necessarily the priority for all the rest of the believers, because others had got other callings and ministries to attend to. Here's something that John Stott said about this, which I think is rather well said. I think I've had that up already. Yes, here it is. Here's what John Stott says. It's in his book, The Contemporary Christian. He says, it is a wonderful thing to be a missionary or a pastor if God calls us to it. But it is equally wonderful to be a Christian lawyer, industrialist, politician, manager, social worker, television script writer, journalist or homemaker if God calls us to it. According to Romans 13 verse 4, an official of the state, whether legislator, magistrate, policeman or policewoman, is just as much a minister of God, diakonos theu, as a pastor. There is a crying need, says John Stott, for Christian men and women who see their daily work as their primary Christian ministry and who determine to penetrate their secular environment for Christ. But if we are to penetrate that secular environment, the public square, the workplace for Christ, then we need something more than just engagement with it, which is what we've been talking about. We are also called to distinctiveness. So we're to be engaged, yes, but we're to be engaged as Christians, as saints in the marketplace, because we are called to be holy which basically means to be different, to be distinctive. This calling on distinctiveness, this moral distinctiveness to start with, was actually an essential part of the faith of Old Testament Israel. Here's a passage in Leviticus chapter 18, uh, where God is wanting the Israelites to understand that he wanted them to be what he says in chapter 19, he wanted them to be holy. But what does that mean? Well, he says, you must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you, where you're going to live. Do not follow their practices. No, you must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees because I am the Lord your God. So keep my decrees and laws for the man who obeys them will live by them because I am the Lord. And you see, 
that's actually what holiness meant for Israel. It meant being different, different from the idolatrous cultures around them, whether the empire of Egypt or the kind of health, wealth and prosperity Baal cult uh, of Canaan. And so that distinctiveness, that holiness was to be worked out ethically, morally, in everyday, ordinary social life. So if you go on to read Leviticus chapter 19, yeah, it starts with, be holy, for I am the Lord your God am holy. But then it goes on to articulate that, to explain what that means in a whole range of contexts, which are personal, family life, social life, the workplace, employment practices, the law courts, the fields, the farm, even ethnic relationships, and in business and commercial realms. So you see this distinctiveness of God's people in the Bible, it's not just religious. It, it's not just as if we're saying, well, we happen to worship a different God from you guys, so that's why we've got this religion and you've got that religion. No, no, it's meant to be ethical distinctiveness. We are called to live by different standards. And that, I think, is what Jesus means when he talks about how his followers, his disciples, are salt, salt of the earth and the light of the world, he says in Matthew chapter 5. And those give us some crucial insights into what it means to belong to Jesus in the public arena. Because those two metaphors, salt and light, they combine to remind us, don't they, that the world around us is both corrupt and dark. See, salt stops meat or fish becoming bad and rotten, and light obviously dispels the darkness. So these are active agents that make a difference in the surrounding, penetrating the food and sustaining it or shining in the dark room. So Jesus means that his disciples must be like that. So when Christians, when you or I were engaged in our places of work, things ought to be a bit less rotten, a bit less dark. Not, of course, that we can make everything perfect. Of course not. Uh, we're not Jesus himself. The end has not yet come. But we should be making some difference. And did you notice also, when you read those verses, how Jesus says that our light should shine, not by our wonderful testimony and our great preaching, but by our good works. He says, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works. It's by the way we live, the way we behave, that it should be attractive and ultimately drawing to people to glorify our Heavenly Father. And once again, uh, I can just share with you something that John Stott used to like to, to say when he was preaching on this. I've heard him say these things several times. He would say, look, if a piece of meat goes rotten, it's no use blaming the meat, because that's what happens when bacteria do their work. The question to ask is, where was the salt? And if a house gets dark at night, it's no use blaming the house. That's what happens when the sun goes down. The question to ask is, where is the light? So if society becomes more corrupt and more dark, it's no use blaming society. That's what fallen human nature does all by itself. The question to ask is, where are the Christians? Where are the saints who will actually live as saints? God's different people, God's salt and light in those places of public life and work. And as I said earlier, Paul applied this even to slaves who in the Roman world of his day must have had just about the worst possible deal of any workplace. And yet Paul tells Christian slaves, even in that condition, he says, this is Colossians 3, he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not just when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and in reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do as slaves, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. And why should slaves behave in that way? Well, this is what Paul writes a little bit later to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. 
Paul says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted. Why? So that in every way they can make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. You see, as Christians, we are called to moral distinctiveness, to be ethically distinctive in the workplace for the sake of the gospel of God, our Savior. And why should we live like that? Well, this is the other part of what I said, that it's not just because of our moral distinctiveness, but also because of our worldview distinctiveness. You see, as Christians, we are living in the Bible story. And it's that great Bible story which sees the whole of human life, work, ambitions, achievements, all of them valid in their own way, all of them intended by God to be part of his creation and what we do and his redemption and his future plans. But we see all of that, all our work, in the context of the overarching biblical story of God's creation through to new creation. In other words, we refuse to make an idol out of the marketplace itself, whether our own personal work there or the market or mammon, the god of greed and financial advancement. Why? We don't make those things our idols because we recognize the ultimate highest reality and we worship the living God alone. You see, even for Christians, work can very easily become an idol, especially if it gets linked into our greed and our acquisitiveness for what our work produces, then it easily begins to take the place of God. And that's why we have this warning uh, in the book of Deuteronomy there in chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, where uh, Moses says to the people of Israel, you, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands has produced all this wealth for me. But remember, it's the Lord your God who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant which he made to your forefathers. So it's not all for you, it's not all just because you made it, it's ultimately God who gives you that ability and he's the one you must worship. So yes, we affirm that work has its value, it has its importance in what it means to be human, but we also affirm the Sabbath, which reminds us that all our work is intended to find rest and fulfillment in the enjoyment of God. Work is not the primary thing in human life. It's not the totality of life. God is. So with this worldview then, God is not an escape from our work. God is not a crutch to help us endure our work. Rather, God is actively involved in all our work in the world, in the public arena in our engagement and our distinctiveness. But I want to finish. And I want to finish with a word to any of you who may be pastors or church leaders in some way. And I want to urge you to accept that part of the function of the church, and especially of pastors, is to support those who live their lives daily as saints in this public arena, out there in the world. You see, Paul tells us, doesn't he, that God has given his church pastors and teachers to equip God's people for works of service, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. And I believe that that phrase, works of service, doesn't just mean Christian activities within the church, but all and any form of service that we may do as Christian believers in society and in the church. So this, this Ephesians 4, it turns right upside down one of the commonest misconceptions that still permeates many churches. Because, believe it or not, God did not invent the church to support the clergy. <laughs> Rather, God gave pastors and teachers to the church in order to equip the saints, God's people. People don't go to church on Sunday to support their pastor in his ministry. It's the other way around. The pastor goes to church on Sunday to support his people in their ministry, which is outside the church, out there in the world, being salt and light in the public square. And so the challenge then to 
pastors is, are you helping ordinary working Christians to understand the world they live in? Or are you just dangling before them every Sunday the prospect of a better world when we all get to heaven or something like that? Are you providing biblical teaching, a biblical worldview for working Christians in their lives and their witness? Are you helping Christians to wrestle with those ethical issues, those conscience issues that they struggle with in the workplace, encouraging them to be faithful and to be men and women of integrity and courage and perseverance? Well, in order to do that, if that's what you should be doing, then, of course, it means that pastors and teachers in the church need to know those problems for themselves and not just live in some kind of spiritual or ecclesiastical bubble. Well, as I finish, I have to say that on this particular topic, I feel rather like a coward because my own working life uh, has mostly been spent not in the secular marketplace of the world, I did have a few years as a school teacher, and then I moved into the professional world of pastoral ministry and theological education. <coughs> but I do have a, a great admiration and indeed a great concern for all of you Christians who do engage every day of your working lives in the workplaces of the world, because you are the Daniels of this world, or at least you can be and you should be. You are the salt of the earth, as Jesus calls you. You are the, the light of the world. And what would it be like if all the millions of Christians who do earn their living in the secular workplace around the world were to take seriously what Jesus meant by being salt and light in the world? You see, your work matters because it matters to God, our creator and our redeemer. And what you do has got some place in God's plans for the new creation. So if you do it conscientiously, if you do it as a disciple of Jesus, willing to bear witness to him and if necessary to suffer for him, then he will enable you and your life to bear fruit in multiplying the citizens of that new creation from among your friends and your working colleagues. And so may God bless you.